Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today, I have a very special returning guest, one of my favorite architects, builders, co-founders, entrepreneurs of all time, David Pollard. He is an architect, a builder, a co-founder of Live Companies, a full-service residential design build company in the Chicago suburbs. Dave started Live Co. in 2012 to provide quality design to suburban homeowners, but with some twists to the traditional architectural services model, following on the heels of his graduate thesis work, stating, quote, to make architecture more accessible, end quote, it's time to, or sorry, it's time to stop trying to redesign the building systems and architects lead the change charge by rethinking the design systems. This evolved into a design build model, which allows simplified deliverables and a fully integrated and accountable team to deliver their products, projects. Uh, David, welcome back to the show. Pleasure to have yeah, you on again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It's been yeah. a long time. Yeah, too long, too long, because I know we'd, we'd exchange messages. I follow you on LinkedIn. I think your posts are fantastic. I'm just, a, I've always been a huge fan of what you're doing up there. Um, and I think where we left off last was you were going to make a transition and a move. Tell tell us about like where, you know, from where we left off to where you're at now, what's what's been happening? Yeah, it's um, about next week, it'll be two years. Um, my family and I moved down to North Carolina. So we're in the, we're in Raleigh, so the Triangle area. Um, that was, uh, it's interesting cause my, my business is in Chicago. I have a business partner, luckily. So we're able to kind of manage that, but it's a couple of things that fell into place. One during COVID more and more virtual work started happening anyway. Most of my job is sales and marketing, um, as it relates to our company now. So I do that virtually and was doing that virtually in Chicago. So the stars kind of aligned that that was possible. Um, and then it was really fundamentally a personal decision that my wife and I were from the East Coast, moved to Chicago right after school 21 years ago, and at some point started to think about getting closer to our families because we're both big fan from big families. So that's how that kind of came about in conversations about seven years ago. And then it, five years ago, we said, if we're going to do this, we need to put a three-year plan together. And then two and a half years ago, it kind of happened and then we did it. And it's still kind of a blur, but it's been... Uh, quite quite an adventure and so you're building a house down there too right at the same time yeah so you know it's a personal decision to is important for our family as our kids are growing to move down here but there's also business opportunity yeah so the whole idea of being able to do what we do in chicago in a different market was intriguing um and this is a market that's big and growing and i think our angle is is everything's pretty cookie cutter in the Southeast, most houses are built like 1990 and up. Um, they're ready to be remodeled and they're just all the same 1990s houses. And a lot of people moving here from California, New York, Chicago, all over the place that maybe might be looking for something a little bit different. So to bring a little bit of what we do in Chicago to here, and then uh, my wife and I bought a house, 1990 house that you know needed some fixing up to say the least. and classic architect brain i probably um overcompensated and tried to make it the coolest house ever and then decided to build it so we should be finishing it next week okay cool <laughs> yeah but it's a remodel right this isn't a or is there an addition to it's, it's an addition and a remodel okay yeah. and so it's 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 uh you know a prototype project right because um i think some of the stuff you want to talk about is starting a design build business yeah <laughs> So in Chicago, we've been doing it for 12 years, almost 13 years, and we have a network of, you know, people that we work with that just kind of happens, right? You move to a new place, I don't have anything, right? So I got to find trades. Um, I've got to understand, you know, a different permitting process. I do pre-inspection walks with inspectors because I've never done a North Carolina inspection walk. It's very different than what we deal with up north. So it's a lot of... Um, uh, learning how to do it again <laughs> mm -hmm. um and it's it's kind of an opportunity to to start from scratch and build something but so many design build or architects in general start this doing their own house because you know you don't have a client to deal with my i have a schedule but you know it's 
it's my schedule. I'm not having people yelling at me because, you know, my tile guy isn't there yet. Right. Cause I don't have a tile guy. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So that's, what's going on with the house down here. How do you, okay. It seems like, I think that's, you know, one of the things I talked about on, on our show in trying to con in, convince people in the architecture community to take the, take the leap to design build and become builders, you know, spread out their, uh, their legs and their stool of their business, meaning this, you know, diversity. In, in, if there's any way there's diversity is our strength, it's like through through different typologies and then we can, you know, lean on one on the other and, and maybe be a bit more recession proof or depression proof as business owners in that kind of way. Uh, so, so, you know, what I mentioned was to people is I'm like, well, you should just do exactly what David's doing or what I did, which is, you know, I've designed and built, you know, the first house I, I bought in 2013, I gutted it. I read it all myself. I, I hired a few subs and got, got to know a few that way. When my wife and I designed and built our first, uh, a big house in 2015, 16, I found a lot of subs that way. Um, I wasn't even the general contractor on that, but at least I got some of the basics, uh, down with that. I also learned the building, I sort of relearned the building process locally with the inspectors and all of that. Then we went and did our development. It was kind of this natural evolution. It seems like it's a, that's a way to hack into a new market or at least find reliable people um, if, if you're trying to make this transition. Yeah, ab absolutely. Right. I mean, you're going to have to do it at some point anyway. So when you do it in your own project, it's just makes, makes sense. Right. Um, it's also allows you to experiment a little bit more, right. With different things where you can fail and then fix it later yourself <laughs> or something like that. Um. But yeah, I mean, finding finding local trades is is a challenge. Um, there's a language barrier as well. Um, a lot of Spanish speaking down here. Um, we had that up north, but I always felt like you know there were, were bilingual, there were English speaking bosses or someone that we could talk to down mm -hmm. here. I mean, I have a lot of trades because I, I can't hire the retail, you know, flooring guy. I got to hire the guy that doesn't have a retail marketing budget, right? He wants to work for me. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. Right. Yeah. So finding those people, you're often going to have a language barrier and you have to find that balance of the guy that is a craftsman that knows what he's doing or she, right. But, um, isn't trying to build out, you know, a retail operation and work for homeowners. And then you establish the same relationships with them that we do up North, which is, I mean, it's really a respect and appreciation for what they do pay them quickly. They ask me for money, I'll bring them a check that day, right? Like it's, we help each other out, right? You tell me when you're going to be done, you're done. I will hand you a check that day. It's that easy. Because um, I have found a lot of the trades down here have been strung out and they've told me all the stories, you know, of builders that just don't pay them. So, you know, just establishing good relationships with them. Um, and it's obviously way, way easier to do on your own house because you can take a little bit more risks with things and control your own schedule a little bit more. Um, does that answer that question? A hundred percent. And one other way, one other way that I have went from like, let, let's say you, you know, you're doing what David does or, or what I did, did on other houses. And maybe you, there's 12 subs involved, different kinds, different trades. And maybe out of, out of 12, those 12, there's only six that you, you're like, ah, you know, the other six just did okay. Sometimes they didn't show up, you know, the work was okay, but it wasn't phenomenal. And you sort of, coalesce around maybe these half a dozen people from there then one of my recommendations to folks thinking about making this transition is like okay how do you expand again to the 12 that you need on your next project is i always just ask those other subs that especially my, like my number one or number two subs do you have anybody who does this they all know each other there's a, sort of this big family especially in especially in the hispanic community it's a it's a very big family you know they they really kind of take that loyalty uh to heart they often have a cousin a brother um, like, and then, you know, that, that's, that's sort of my take on it. And then they even, they'll even point out subs that they like to work with in conjunction. For example, on this house we're building in, in Colorado right now, the framers recommended the ciders and those two actually work real well together. And they sort of intersect right at the rafter tails. I'm not even joking. Like the way Absolutely. they, the way to do the framing was a little bit different than what we were used to doing. But now that I've seen the final product, I'm like, oh, that craftsmanship is, is phenomenal. Yeah, I, same thing. I had a I, I needed a custom stair. Um, it's an important piece. I can't just hire a guy that says, "Oh yeah, I know how to build a stair." So on that, I actually reached out to um, local builders that I know through a uh, through a network, 
Um, and you know, I don't call every local builder and say, Hey, who do you use for this? Yeah. It's just not cool. Right. But they're all very open and willing to share. Um, and I'm going to circle back to that in just a moment too, but mm -hmm. on the stair. So I talked to uh Waker modeling, Luke Dobbins. And he's like, yeah, I got a great stair. So stair guy. So I talked to Robert and I said, Robert, who do you, um, who's a good guy to use for wood flooring? He gave me Yarick's number. So wood floors and stairs meet each other, right? So now they're using the same finish. They're understanding they can talk to each other about who's going to sequence what, as opposed to those two things coming together and being completely separate. Um, but to circle back on networking, um, so Home Builder Association, National Association of the Remodeling Industry, Pro Remodeling, um, you know, other people that do house flips. There's a lot of local people who love to talk to people who are thinking about doing this. And I did a little bit of that. And then I got extremely lucky and that when we bought our house, we walked around the neighborhood and handed out flyers to introduce ourselves as a family, not as a business, just to say, hey, this is us. Buying the house is going to be a total mess. We have a whole bunch of work we want to do, but we're really excited to meet everyone. Here's my phone number if you want to call and my email address. So one of the fellows down the street is a builder. So he saw the flyer and he looked me up and he's like, oh, wait, this guy does like the same kind of stuff that I do. Right. So he we had coffee. Um, we kind of exist in similar networks. We know similar people. We've been on similar podcasts. I mean, it's like kind of hilarious. Oh, wow. And so Jake then emailed me his Excel spreadsheet of all of his trades. Wow. Created. And every single one of them has been absolutely outstanding. And, you know, I've bought him one fruit basket, but I owe him a lot, a lot more than that. Oh my God. But, um, yeah. And I think when you kind of come across similar good people in this industry they're honestly all rooting for each other and trying to help each other out and know that good stuff's going to come his way i'm going to learn stuff and we're all we're all sharing and we're all trying to do good stuff we're not stepping on each other's feet there's plenty of work to go around and he's excited because it keeps his trades busy yeah. right now they're part part of his network that he kind of grows and you know if he needs someone over here and then i need someone here you know we all kind of work together so yeah, it's really, I, it's it's really cool. I think the building side of things has taught me that, for mm -hmm. sure. Maybe look maybe look at the architecture side of things a little bit differently in the sense of like, I think a lot of architects are worried that there's not enough work to go around, and we're finding as builders we're like, no, no, there's plenty. As a matter of fact, like we're in such high demand as builders, at, at least I am. Um, yeah, people are just striving for like honesty, integrity, answering the phone. Because they've, you know, while the trades have been strung along, I think clients have been strung along too for a long time. And that now we're people like hopefully like David and I and, and anybody else who's a, a good design slash builder, we're trying to like flip the script a little bit and go like, no, 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 there's there's actually plenty of good general contractors out there. Um, we're not all bad in that kind of way. And then yeah, I have a lot of I even though we're competitors with some of the biggest guys in Boulder County now, I go like, oh my gosh, no, no, we're we're still buddies. Like I'll pick up. I'll pick up the phone and be able to call Jim at any time and we can exchange subs and go like, Hey, but do you have anybody recommend for this? And then he goes, Oh, I'm glad you called. Actually. I was looking for, a, I wonder if you have any other plumbers you could, you could recommend. And we go back and forth. Cause you're right. They're, they're very hand to mouth to subcontractors, right? So like they get, they take, they take the money and it's just there and they're eating it. And they're already almost hungry again by the time they're done. So we got to keep them busy because it, it's, it's still very tough out there on the labor market um to find good quality people so keeping them going in that kind of way um is very important uh have since we last talked has the scale of your projects changed are you guys doing more volume but like the same kind how have you guys evolved since then definitely larger and more sophisticated projects so probably last time we talked you know average project size is probably 250 300 now we're probably 500 plus something like that um that's been its own challenge because those projects are a little bit more demanding um, and we're trying to circle back and bring in more two to three hundred thousand dollar projects just because those um, can move a little bit faster because when you fill up your pipeline with with all large larger projects and this is Chicago area I know you know half a million dollars in Boulder doesn't get you very far <laughs> yeah <laughs> that barely buys the stone right <laughs> yeah. um, but uh it, it's you know if you just look at 
a scale of a project, it's harder to it's harder to fill that backlog. It's just a different animal, or it's a different way to fill the backlog. So we've been struggling with that a little bit to, um, you know, have a range of project sizes to fill in between um, workflow wise. How about you yeah. guys? Now, are you doing service stuff? Or are you guys doing mostly development? Uh, service. So yeah, I mean, we're doing everything from. Um... Last summer we did an interior remodel of like a kitchen. We knocked down a wall. We we did a we did a bathroom. That's probably one of our smaller ones. To now this year we have two two million dollar plus homes. They're very large budgets. They're super custom. One is like ten thousand square feet. One is six thousand square feet. And then everything in between. We just started a a, a commercial project. We're converting a three story building to. Um, we're keeping commercial on the set on the first floor. Top two floors are going to turn into five apartments. So that's kind of our range. I would say it's reflective of our architecture in that way too, where it's like we're very heavy. 50% of us is into custom single family residential. Other 25% is commercial and industrial. And then the other part is uh, multifamily, which multifamilies just died. I don't know if you're seeing that or if you guys are working in that, but like the, the developers can't get it to pencil out with the interest rates. So it kind of is what it is. Um, so we haven't done any of that uh, for probably about a year in that way. Yeah. yeah. How how does your approach to design like what's your guys' approach to design fees for design build projects? Is I think I've asked you this before, but I, I feel like I should bring it to the surface again because you never know if people evolve. Like, are you guys architects first, then you're negotiating the build project later? Is it all in one? Is it all of the above? Um, we're we're architects first, but we we want people to align with the package, right? So if someone says, Hey, will you design and then maybe not build it we say you have that option mm -hmm. but we want to build it and that's the direction you want to go we're probably not the right fit for you um because you know my design team needs to fill feed my production team unless i built out a larger design team that could you know as a percentage just do design only stuff um the other piece of that is the way we do drawings is for our team to build them so it's not mm. uh CYA architectural drawing set where we just note everything, right? Like I want the, the leanest drawing set possible. I want the least amount of information that my team knows how to build it as opposed to, you know, a typical architectural drawing set, which is just piles of notes that no one reads and it's just all, yeah. um, you know, cover your ass kind of stuff. So building off of our drawings would need more stuff um, and the way we do our drawings and then our interior design set as well. So we're not really set up for that. Um, but the way we structure our fees or our system um, is we we have a first design step called feasibility design, and that we charge a flat fee for depending on the project type. Typically, on average, it's sixty five hundred bucks, which allows us to come and field measure an entire house, develop a concept design with a budget, mm -hmm. deliver that information to them. They give us feedback, then we do concept B with a budget, and then we go to detail design, which is architectural interior design and pre-construction services. And that's 10% of the budget that comes out of feasibility. I'm really try to keep it simple from an accounting standpoint and just being able to not have to write proposals and just say, boom, boom this is it, right? Here's a number, here's a number, here's the number. Um, and then we're doing budgeting throughout detail design as well. So that when we get to the end of that, they're, um, construction contract price, which is a fixed price lump sum, isn't a surprise, right? It's evolutionary. And they can see, we're trying to explain to them like, yeah, you decided to do tear out all the hardwood floor on the second floor. And that's why it went up here, right? And they can see that as it goes. It's a really hard piece, really, really crazy hard part of what we do is that. It takes a lot of work. But it's important so that when we tear their house apart, they know how much it's going to cost. Yeah, for sure. I'm actually kind of shocked because I was just in a round table with a bunch of other uh, architects and uh, general contracting um, CEOs in the Boulder, the Boulder County region, Northern Colorado region. And there was a couple other folks that are just like me and you architect plus builder, then there were just builders architects. And the question got asked by the moderator to all of us, like, are we, especially since COVID and all the inflation, the crazy inflation with all the money printing and and the way lumber prices just skyrocketed, everything did, is are we doing fixed fee contracts for building? And the, it was unanimous around the around the around our circle anyway. Is no, we're just all costs plus. So I'm actually amazed that you're doing fixed fee um, in that kind of a way. Like, what kind of strategies are you using to make sure you're compensating for the 
if there is inflation that happens, or are you seeing a tamping down in your areas? I mean, we have an escalation clause in there, so we okay. can claim that if we need to. But um, I mean, really, the key is we moved to construction really quickly from construction contract. We're already in for permit. We're all of that stuff. So I think our design cycle is short enough mm-hmm. that we're at less risk. And then, you know, we we have purchase orders and work orders, um, you know, that are signed off on. If something changes, then we need to talk to our sub about that. Um, we did start building internal contingencies just to make sure because it's easier for us to just cover that instead of go to the client and say, oh, stuff's more expensive now. Um, but we just want to make it simple. And I think, you know, in that market and down here, I think, actually, I guess I'll find out down here, but, um, yeah, you know, fixed price is pretty, pretty industry standard. I mean, I know in California, um, everything's cost plus, like, it's just, there's no other way to do it. But to me, what our clients are looking for, the cost plus model is kind of just a running tab. And I don't know, I think it's scary. Like, just tell me what's going to cost so I can, you know, move the money. Know that it's not going to exceed that unless it's something that I do and we can move on with our lives. Um, But it depends on the clientele, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel as if uh, you guys, that in a lot of, I mean, right away, it's sort of an experiment. Like you're, you're transitioning from architect to design build so you know everybody has their own model we're even pointing out some differences here and like the way we do contracts do you feel though after you've sort of been tenured in this industry now and what you do that you have the ideal team structure and and if not like what is the ideal team structure you think for for somebody of our size in other words somebody that wants to do smaller projects design plus build and maybe the budgets are between the numbers you already talked about half a million to two million dollars so you mean like team structure in terms of uh employees yeah yeah yeah. like uh okay what would be my ideal structure if i'm just starting out you know i'm a uh, i need i obviously have the architecture side of things you know and how does interiors cross pollinate uh you know a contractor plus a superintendent you know what is the at least core team structure that you would need to have set up Yeah, I mean, I'll kind of talk you through our evolution. And yours might actually be very, very similar because you have a partner as well. So, and my partner is a former home builder. So he he knows construction. Um, He knows the people. He knows how to speak the language. And I'm an architect. So when we started, I did all the design and he was a project manager. And I think I was kind of shared services, admin and financial, right? And then the first person that we hired was a site manager, someone to support the project manager so that the project manager who's the business owner can actually, you know, shift over to POs and billing and managing bigger picture stuff. And then the third person we hired, I believe was administrative help, someone to, well, once we got an office, someone to manage receipts and all of that stuff and um, just keep that all running. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth person we hired was architectural support, architectural support, um, Sarah was an architect and her first job was everything. Right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> it ended everything. So I mean, it's yeah. The with everything. Yeah. Um, interior design selections, all of that stuff. And it was definitely a big turning point when we hired an interior designer and we hired Anna and that was a game changer. And it helped Sarah and I realize we're both architects. We think architects think they're good at all design. We think we're great graphic designers, right? If it's design, we're the best at it. No. <laughs> yes, you're so right, David. Yes. There's there's people that specialize in graphic design that are way better, and there's people that specialize in interior design. And so when we hired Anna, we quickly realized, like, whoa, we clearly didn't know what we were doing. We knew what we liked, but we didn't necessarily know how to get there, or we just weren't, weren't trained in that. It, it showed you guys what you didn't know, right, or that you weren't good enough. Sort of was a mirror. But what else did it do, David? Like, who else did it help the most, do you think? Do you think it helped the superintendent of the construction projects? Do you think it helped the architects? Did it help everybody equally? I will say for us— equally. Okay. Right? Yeah, because yeah. someone who's who's dialed into the details of putting together, you know, interior design and selections. Number one, the client's way more enthused about it because they're getting that interior design experience. Mm-hmm. Which, frankly, I lose interest in about fifty percent. Right. Like I picked a chair. Now let's move on. I don't feel like putting together into a whole presentation package to talk about that chair and how it works with the carpet. Right. Like I just that's not that's not my wheelhouse. And then, but being able to put that together and then be able to get the client's appreciation and sign off on it makes it easier when it goes to production because now everybody's on the same page and they have the information that they need to build it. 
Um, that's a huge piece of it and often um, frequently um, under underappreciated, like what goes into that. It is definitely not, you know, paint and pillows. It it's is, not decorating. Yeah, it is not at all. It is a crazy amount of nuanced coordination amongst a billion little things. And it's what the client sees for the rest of their lives. They don't care what the wall stud and where the wire is going through the wall stud, right? But all those little things coming together are huge. I'm so, I'm, I'm with you. Around. How many, how many years after from when you guys started, did you hire that interior designer? Like how many, how, how long did it take? Uh, in our current kind of structure doing, you know, design, custom design, build remodeling, probably two years should have been sooner but we 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 were organically grown right we mm -hmm. waited till we had the work and then we're overloaded until we filled our box of what we were capable of and then hired um at the beginning then we kind of started to realize and we joined peer groups and started looking at other business structures and realized like it, i think it's time to invest in really building out a team um and then we added project managers additional design support uh pre-construction and estimating uh all that stuff. So we're 11 now and we're, we do about 5 million and we're, we are at capacity. Uh, I'd say we run, we run relatively lean, but um, we're also trying to make our processes a little bit more efficient along the way. Right. It's always a balance. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm glad you pointed out. So we just hired an interior designer full-time. Uh, her name is Sarah. She's doing great. And uh, already my construction, so the reason I asked about like who who it's affected the most, because I'm curious, just to, we're rating into it. Like she's in, this is her second, no, no, this is her first full-time week at F9. She had been doing uh, some part-time work as she was finishing interior design school and stuff like that. And the need, it was actually the building side of things that drove the decision more than the architecture side of things and us trying to have an interior design department. I still want that for sure. Um, but, you know, the first pressure valve that she released was with the superintendent because he's like, I'm not an interior designer. Why am I in charge of trying to have the client pick out whatever they're going to do and then keep track of it? And I go like, right, for right now, it just is what it is. This is how you grow a company is you bite off more than you can chew. Then you chew mm -hmm. through what you can. <laughs> and then and then eventually hopefully you get enough work then you can hire people and that's like that's how the growth works like there's no perfect way about doing this stuff um so man i'm really excited about sarah as well i think and i'm the part where you talked about yeah nobody cares about the studs 100 percent right like it's not interior decorating at all it is a valuable portion now of our building side of things where it's just release the pressure valve but then also provided the customer with that experience and I think it's going to streamline everything, um, you know, in terms of construction. Like, I don't know. How, how far are you having your interiors understand, like, even substrates, you know, underneath tile and everything like that? Is that, is there an, inter how does that intersection point work? So, I mean, that's a great point. So we don't go that far, but we work with a tile vendor installer. So we kind of lean on them for, you know, understanding as opposed to us sourcing the tile and having some guy installing is like, well, am I going to do this right? So, you know, there's certain places where we'll use a little bit more sophisticated outfits that can deal with those technicalities. Um, you know, where the client chooses a 48 by 48 inch shower tile floor, and then our tile vendor says, well, you're going to slip and fall. We're going to have to make that smaller, <laughs> you know, or find a different tile. So, you know, I think, and we also have one interior designer, right? So I think if we had a larger, interior design team we could and at some point we need to i mean anna definitely needs support mm -hmm. we would probably dial into more of those and then be able to do the source and then match with the labor but um that's another incredible resource as you're growing is to lean on your subs um, yeah ask ask them how they would do it like our exterior people um who do our, our sidings siding and roofing i mean when we're trying to do different siding materials I don't just go to a builder show and say, hey, put this up. You know, I don't even know if he can get it, right? So we talk about aesthetics and then talk about what we're trying to achieve and then work through the best system to achieve that. And then, you know, my documentation doesn't even have to go that far, right? If I'm doing a rain screen, I just call it rain screen. He knows what we're doing, right? Or I'll list that in the work order. 
or that's in his PO, right? Um, so that's 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 another like really really incredibly valuable tool. Think about it with Windows. Like I can only go so far with window technology, um, but my window rep knows a lot about Windows. So I'm going to bring yeah. him out, and we're going to talk about if it makes sense to do a full tear out here, or if we should do. Um, you know, inserts or what our what our different options are. So I I think in the architectural community, there's always a feeling of wanting to know everything about everything. But I there's certain things where I just want to lean on the people that live in that world, um, and and use their expertise. And anyway, that kind of relates to someone growing this on their own. Um, you know, trade partners, vendor partners are incredible resources for that stuff. What do you what do you think it's done to you as psychologically as an architect then with that these sort of scenarios that you're pointing out where you're, it's you doing very lean drawings uh, just noting rain screen like has it made you uh, and I'm, this isn't a personal attack but I know I used to be this way too is like less anal like are you more free and comfortable like is it confident like what I don't even know what word I'm looking for here yeah I mean I don't my expertise. I, I, there's, I, mean, I worked for architecture firms. You work for architecture firms. Yeah. They all do different things. Everyone has different roles, provide different value. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't. My my role as an architect, I don't think was ever supposed to be um, in writing a technical manual. Um, and there's people that can do that or want or have a passion in that, but like, I just don't. Yeah, I mean, yes, I guess to answer your question, yes, it makes me less anal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's I, exact. I'm still, I think both of us actually stumbling over what we're trying to describe is probably good enough for now. Like maybe we, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to like in real time here, describe even for myself, like what it has done for me. I, I, it's maybe more, maybe this, maybe this is what it is. It's maybe more comfortable with the unknown or comfortable with the yeah. uncomfortable part of it. Yeah. Cause I yeah. can see it in my superintendent. I don't know if you've experienced that with, you know, people who are out there in the field too, where they're like really nervous about something. And then you're like, ah, it'll work out. <laughs> oh man. I remember there's a job site where I was freaking out about how we're going to route plumbing through this thing. And I'm there with the plumber and he's like, I'm sure you'll figure it out, Dave. <laughs> and we did, we found yeah. a place to put it and we saw, and you know, we we try and limit those things that we're going to solve. But in our drawing set, we don't always solve it on the drawings, but we mark it and call it out as like, this is going to be something that we're going to have to figure out. Because if we figure it out on paper right now, it's going to be wrong. But mm -hmm. we've identified it. We've discussed it with the clients. We don't know totally how we're going to do this, but we have, you know, a couple of different scenarios. You know, routing mechanicals is always a challenge. Um, but yeah, I just... It, that's the difference is like we're ultimately responsible for the built space and we're involved in it throughout it's not just i'm handing over a set of drawings and then i'm going to bill you when i have to come to the job site to figure something out because the contractor is an idiot because i already figured it out right like i mean we could talk about it for hours about how dysfunctional the design bid, bid build yeah um, system is in residential design and that's why people don't have good design because it's just too too silly it just takes too much time mm -hmm. um but on that same note on the less anal part so live companies we started in 2012 before that i had a little just kind of side llc design firm that i named live funner f-u-n-n-e-r and my thinking then was i worked for chicago architecture firms that were very anal <laughs> and i was like well maybe this is why people don't have good design because there's just this emphasis on it having to be perfect like can't it just be like really good or what if it's just better than this pulte home that i live in this is a, our pulte rental which no offense pulte it's perfectly fine but it is, awful. <laughs> it is the weirdest i just don't understand it and i don't know why i have to turn two light switches to turn a light on and off anyway oh. um so that was like the whole idea is like can't we just provide something that makes it a little bit better and maybe just having fun with it being a little bit looser with it or like the Japanese principle of wabi-sabi of like those little imperfections are what make it good or interesting maybe there's something to that uh, so yes it's made me less anal yeah yeah there you go yeah and again uh 
I, I, let's move over to like checks and balances. This is this is something that I've been experiencing lately. I'm curious about your how you have. I'll just tell you a quick, a very quick story. What I've been noticing is like, okay, I I I have two. I have a superintendent that works for us, Alex and I, and he oversees the projects in conjunction with me and Al. Um, but then also uh, we have two in-house carpenters. One is a master, one is a journeyman. Uh, they're both very good. They both give a crap. They can do almost any trade. I've I've spent a lot of money over the last two years, like training them, even hiring my dad to come down and like teach him how to do drywall, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so sometimes we sub things out. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do in-house stuff. Sometimes we don't. Uh, I like to call our team the polishing team. We will come in and polish the project, do all the fit, do a lot of the finished work, but sometimes we'll frame things. So most recently I had them, um, uh, come in, they needed a little, they need, we needed to fill a gap between two projects. And I go, well, I told my framer who I subbed out this $2 million house to, he's doing a fantastic job. His name is Danny. He's, he's just phenomenal. He's doing the framing on it is insane. We're doing circles. It's, it's nuts. And, uh, then I had my guys, I go, you guys, how about you guys come out and build the stairs, just wood stairs. And that'll fill two days of your time between, between the two job sites. They built one of the stairs wrong. It's our, we're out of head, head height. I showed them the drawing and I go, we got to rebuild it guys. And it's, it's an interesting checks and balance check. What I'm finding is I go, if Danny would have built that wrong, I would have just said, you got to do it over. Like you don't even get an excuse for a change order. Obviously you did it wrong. Here's the yeah. proof. If my guys build it wrong, I'm writing the check. Like it is what it is. So it, have you experienced this in any kind of way? Like for me, it raises the standard for my own carpenters. And then it's also just a check and a balance on the check and balance. Yeah, totally. I mean, doing my own house is a perfect example of it, right? Like if I make a mistake, it's not even my company paying for it. Like if I tell someone to do something or my drawing's wrong and they do it the way they're done it, like my company doesn't even absorb that and get shared amongst everything. It's literally out of my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> like I have to pay for it, right? Or do it myself. Um so, so yeah, so I, I, I deal with that, um, every day on my own project. Now we do sub everything out, okay. uh, but we do have to, we, we do pay a lot of extras to our subs. Um, if we're not giving them that right information mm. and then we note that and, you know, lesson learned, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, we wouldn't have a stair issue because if they built it wrong, they'd be like, shit, we got to tear it out and build it again. And we're like, well, you better hurry up because the painters coming tomorrow you know yeah <laughs> um so yeah i can i can i can see that and we we haven't we haven't had in-house labor for years um and the reason we went to the subcontractor model is i don't know that we were really good at hiring and managing um tradesmen and yeah. knowing that world very well but most importantly our our project sizes were changing and diverse and there were certain projects that they just couldn't handle sure. um and so we need to bring in subs anyway but i love the idea of the polishing crew um we have denny who's our field tech and he's kind of our jack of all trades who does some of that but mm -hmm. in terms of building a stair that's um that'd be a little bit different yeah it's it's like anything a double-edged sword right so like if, if 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 you have if you have what i've just described where you have the you have the in-house carpenters and everything. The positive part is like they do, they don't get to dictate their schedule like a subcontractor does. So if I have an emergency, we need to come in and we need to knock this out. It's like I'm going to just call you guys to fix the problem. It's it's going to be cheaper overall than me having to sub it out again. But then at the same time, there's this well, if something goes wrong, I'm writing the check. Like I can't I can't put it on a subcontractor. So it sort of is what it is. But I at least wanted to. Um, how does it, if a client asks you, like, how do you guys keep yourself in check, right? If we're sort of skewing the OAC, the typical OAC triangle, what is your response to them, David? Like, how do you tell them that you're keeping yourself in check as the builder, but you were the architect too? I mean, I don't know if that question has ever really come up, but yeah, I okay. mean, that's, that's kind of the argument you get on the design community from the AIA, right? Like, yeah, kind of yeah. Oh, they like, come up. You know what are we doing here? Um, we're we're and insurance is weird too, right? So like mm -hmm. our um, errors and omissions is more expensive because we're and we have 
general liability, right? So like we're we're the only people that anybody's going to sue. So everything that we do, we're tremendously at risk. So yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that just comes down to building trust. Um, you know, they can if they feel like I'm not upholding my levels of architectural license integrity, which is a professional license, and I'm a member of the AIA. They can go straight to the state. They can go right to the AIA and report me, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, and I'm I'm pretty at risk in this entire thing. And my stamps on the drawings, because Live Companies is not an architecture firm because I'm a 50% owner. So it's me, right? So, you know, I don't think that, I think it comes down to building trust, you know, maintaining professional relationships. I think having conversations like this, you know, and being out there and being out in the professional, um, uh, what do you call it, world, you know, I write articles for Program Modeler, I write articles for... Uh, JLC, things like that, you know, just kind of continuing to to establish your your credibility, I think, should should answer that question pretty well, right? And having a, a given track track record. Um, and that's why I think a lot of that stuff is is important. Um and you know, if we do make the decision to have someone else do the work, we're gonna be damn sure that they're going to be the appropriate people to do the work. And if not, we'll tear it down and we'll do it again. You know, like they just have to trust that. Um, I guess that that's what my answer would be. Yeah, I think you're right. It's the trust. And I'm glad you designated the difference. Like, where is this coming from? Because I haven't heard that much either. Mm -hmm. I think Al's heard that one time. And we've been, we do, we're, we're, we do about the same kind of revenue as you. So you can probably imagine the, the amount of projects and volume that we're doing to when you combine the firms around, around 5 million, if you, if you do both companies together uh, each year now. Um, but it, yeah, it's coming from the AIA. It's like, I get, and I get why the AIA would do that. You know, that's sort of their justification for fees. the, you're right. They get their fees, they get their OAC <laughs> contracts. It's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Right. And then um, yeah, it's like home inspectors. There's a whole world and, you know, plus there's, we're in Chicago, so the building inspections are intense, right? There's so many layers of checks and balances. Like, it's not worth it to not do it right. Um, I mean, I remember hearing stories of people that would, uh, builders that would uh, counterfeit a building permit and put it in the window. Like, the nerd, like, who? <laughs> like, why? Why don't just go through and get, like, the pain that you would go through and being caught in a counterfeit Oh, government? like, are you crazy? Yeah, so, I don't know that that world, maybe the AIA was invented to like, you know, make sure that that world didn't exist. But we don't we don't play in that world anyway. Yeah, right, right. And then as, as a business, there's other stuff too, like, you know, plumbing. So say the all the plumbing in the house is done, but one of the sink drains isn't done because it wasn't in yet. And so the plumber has to come back to do that. We're not going to send our guys to do that. We're going to send our plumber, right? Mm -hmm, the licensed mm -hmm. plumber. And the reason being, because that licensed plumber owns all of that. Yep. As soon as we touch one of the things and we call him back, he's like, oh, well, that's the thing that you did, right? Like, we don't want that. We want it to be a really clean cut that the professionals are owning each piece of it is, is another important, really, really super important piece of it. Um, with all these you know, projects in our history and everything else, we need to be able to know that. We need to be able to look that up and say, oh, Marston did all the plumbing in this. Let's get him out there immediately. He knows the system. We didn't touch it, right? Yeah. What's one of the biggest surprises that you've had um, getting into this design build arena? And 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 here's one, here's one of mine. And I don't know if you've had a similar one. I just told this to Sarah this morning, an interior designer. I go, what, I go, what you're going to find in the blue collar world is a surprise that we found, which is, for any given sub, let's say it's a plumber. We have all these assumptions like, oh yeah, that's in your scope, that's in your scope, that's in your scope, it's, it's plumbing related. And then we come to find like, what? You don't do that part of it though? I don't understand how you don't do that. Have you had any surprises like that where you're like, well, that's, I had no idea you didn't do that, but it seems like you should have. Well, especially in North Carolina, right? Because I'm in a completely different labor market. So there's things that I would just expect to be done that by a trade that aren't done that would be done in chicago wood floors for example 
typically whatever wood flooring company that we hire puts in wood floor vents. Like that's just what we, that's what all the companies do in Chicago. Down here, he did all the flooring and then there's this holes where the vents are. And I was like, can you do wood floor vents? And he's like, yeah, but you would have had to tell me that before. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. now I got a guy coming to cut, cut in. The stair guy's going to come out. He's, gonna, he's like custom making these floor vents. So those are, those are a couple kind of fun, funky little things. Um, it's sim similar and related is, uh, and maybe it's some of the trades that I'm working with, but a lot of them don't supply any materials. Like zero. So drywall, like I had to supply drywall. That's a first for me. Huh? Like, yeah, usually we hire a drywall company. They deal with stocking it, like talking to different drywall suppliers and getting them to stock. It was something that I had not experienced before and probably cost me a, a, about a two week delay, if not more, and just trying to get 200 sheets of drywall into the house. Um, so that, that's been interesting amongst uh, kind of figuring out trades here. I'm trying to think of any other ones, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you on that. Um, and it's hard to like bullet point and we do a detailed scope for every trade, right. In the work order, but like, you know, we don't say make sure you use one, one and five eighths inch screws, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like at some point. Yeah. At some point we got to make some assumptions. Yeah. And I just think, that's the mindset. The mindset is if you're if you're thinking about going down this route that David and I are going in, that have went into and been swimming in now for years, like your expectation is just kind of like have some, but at the same time, under, allow yourself some sort of flexibility just mentally of like, I might run into scenarios like David and Lance are talking about where like, what? You don't do that? Okay. All right. Well, we cross that threshold. On the next project, we will know what you do and you don't do. It's all good. And we'll outline the scope a little bit better. It's, I think it's just part of the evolution, uh, you know, in, in this in this arena. Yeah, uh, I mean, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, David. I was just going to say, you know, in circling back to, to going into design build, I mean, there's no better way than doing your own house because, I mean, this is, I did my addition and remodel in Chicago 10, probably 10, 11 years ago. And I quickly forgot how difficult it is. Uh, it is a massive amount of work that goes into what our companies do. And as an owner where you're less involved in, you know, what goes on day to day and you're pushing schedules and making sure invoices go out and make sure things are pretty, you, you kind of lose, lose track of how, how many variables and factors from people to materials, to site access, to nails and tires, to all these little things, um, it's really a good reminder of of why design only architecture firms exist. Yeah, <laughs> it totally this is way did. harder. It's, it's harder. Way harder. Yeah, and then the risk versus reward, right? I mean, we're taking on more responsibility, so we should get more reward for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, that's why I'm so glad to know you, David, and I have some like a comrade in this fight um you know of of doing design build because it's a different animal but man it's uh there's a different level of satisfaction too and you're done with the project oh, absolutely. yeah i could i couldn't not build stuff i mean you saw the stuff on linkedin like i'm r and d my own you know stair slat wall because i don't know how we're going to build it i'm sourcing stuff so you know i i like i like making stuff and i've always talked about how many architects i think are out there that kind of dream of this world but they kind of get into that track of architecture firm and they just they kind of lose it right they, they lose why they went to architecture school in the first place and you start digging in this world and you know i'm in a peer group with similar company in charlottesville virginia an awesome architect design builder in la one in san francisco another one in san francisco jim zach um zach devito i've talked to him before and like this building sounds like a pain in the butt why don't you just give it up he's like no that's why i do it to build i'm like well then why don't you give up the architecture right you know, there's all these, all these, uh, <laughs> there's a pretty impressive network of people who are running really very similar businesses doing really, really cool stuff um, and having fun along the way. But it is, it's a lot of work, but yeah, yeah, total, total reward and it pays better than being an architect or should if you do it right. It totally pays better than being an architect for sure. I, I, I would, I've never been more comfortable uh, financially in my life um, in, in that kind of way. It's, it's, and, and if if you do it right, I think, and the companies can talk to each other because sometimes, you know, like our architects and or interior designers will bill F, our construction company 
And sometimes if my architecture a little bit light, I've brought them out into the field and they do a little bit of field work. You get more opportunity and access to building sites. I, I think there's a lot more positives than there are negatives. Sure, we've talked about the liability and all the other stuff. Um, what do you what do you think is the biggest? If you had to pick one or two cha- challenges, what what do you think is the biggest challenges that you've experienced in this arena of design build, and, and how did you solve those challenges? I mean, I think on a sales and marketing standpoint, it's kind of understanding um, the balance of what the market will bear in in terms of what what we need to charge to run an effective business right i think that that's always always in flux um you know in, in terms of of solving it i mean you just kind of raise your prices until people start saying no i was is one way but you know we're we we have peers and colleagues that we kind of talk to and kind of understand different business models um to try and figure that out um that has that's always in flux, especially as labor and materials go up and all those prices escalate kind of across the way. And, and you know, we're we're trying to sell work in neighborhoods where it's like they're just not going to spend mm-hmm. $600,000 on their house. Um, so kind of just understanding that is, is a challenge in the service world. Oh, man. Then, you know, other ones that we've overcome. Jeez, where do you even begin? I don't know. What's your what, what's your what's one from you? And then I'll. I'll probably come up with one. The the two of them. I have two of them. One was uh, getting somebody. You know, me and Alex are the general contractors. We have licenses, right? But then there's just a superintendent slash foreman. Like I think that's part of the evolution that you should you should GC the first projects if you're doing this fully. Immerse yourself. Understand the process. Get get very deep into it. So then, then hopefully you can train somebody up from there. Uh, you know, you're hiring somebody to do the construction management, actually be out in the field, t- do do the inspections, and go to toe toe to toe with the building inspections and stuff like that. And if you're growing it organically, like like David and I have done, it sounds like it's very similar trajectories yeah. with our firms. Is when you bring people in like that, and if you need to help them understand that you are growing this business organically, and that you're going to go through that process that we talked about earlier, where like the only way to grow this that I know of is we have to bite off more than we can chew. And then we try to chew as much as we can without, you know, killing ourselves. And then we hire people and expand. And it's sort of this ebb and flow that happens and that they have patience with it and understand them. And then, you know, one of the rewards, I think you try to you care, you talk to them about is like having them held out in front of them is like, look, if you just trust me for like three to five years of your life and and I, I will try to pay you as much as possible, I would try to put you in a leader position and, and you can grow with us. Like this is actually an opportunity for you to grow with a company and put yourself in maybe even, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, like a partnership position where you own part of the firm and stuff like that. I think just me having to explain that to my super and my foreman and my carpenters and other people in, in the firm of, just having the patience with us is like, hey, we're not like a hundred year old architecture or contracting firm who has it all figured out and has already went through that. Like we're in the very beginning stages of that. Um, and then the other one is again the interior designer. I think it's so critical. So like if you were to re- if you know, the only way you can start this is if like you wear both hats, architect plus general contractor, and you're gonna quickly find that you need those next two pieces. I think those are the natural evolution pieces. And then, and then architecture support, like you talked about, like that was the core. It's about five people. If you can get to that and you can get people that are in uh, working in in congruence with you and understand your systems, then the multiplication can happen and we can start to really, really grow and take uh, big strides with stuff. Those are my big um, challenges that I've had to overcome. And we just overcome the interior design one. I'm really excited about it. Dude, mine are like literally exactly the same. Like when you yeah. talk about that, I'm in flow and we're still dealing with it. Right. Um, and it's just, we're talking to a business coach the other day and he's like, this has been how this industry has worked since the beginning of time. And if you can figure it out, you could be a trillionaire, right? This is just how it goes. But yeah, it takes a huge amount of patience um, as owners, which I am not good at. Um but I think I've gotten better understanding that and kind of seeing the outlook and then seeing the rewards of when our projects are done and then when national awards and all that. Yeah. Like 
it's another cool thing about what we do is you do get constant positive feedback quickly, right? That keep keeps you going and see and makes it easy to look back and see how far you've come. Um, but then same thing on staff too, right? Like we have been so fortunate that all that first interior designer that we hired, all the people that I listed for the most part have are all working for us, right? Yeah. And they have been through a lot. And they're still going through a lot, right? But they have trusted us. They've trusted the vision. They understand that, you know, there's, there, there, it's more than just a carrot. You know, it's, there's something big at the end. Like we're expanding in North Carolina. Like there's stuff that, that we want to do and want you guys to continue to be part of and grow in this and have ownership opportunities um, is definitely, you know, in, in conversations that we have with the team as a whole. But we also have to show stuff along the way so that they're not calling bs on us right because we're really we need to show how we're improving show how the things that we say that we're going to do we're going to do we may not do them as quickly as dave would like to do them but we get there right so it takes a lot of you know looking back in previous years or even joking about clients from three years ago and being like we haven't had one of those in a while have we Right. That's because we've gotten better because we know that like that client wasn't a good fit for us. Now we know like there's red flags all over the place. We shouldn't have worked for them. They were going to beat us up things like that. Yeah. Um, patience is huge, man. It's giant for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I, again, much the same as you, like I've had to just figure out how to do it, figure out how to be patient, uh, have more empathy. There was a book I read. You should read it. It's called Train Your Empathy. I just had this gal on the podcast. It's amazing. Um, the techniques and just the reassurance I think it gave me where it was like, you know, my first wife told me I had no empathy forever. And I was like, I was like, they can't be true. So I read this book like two years ago uh, and I, I was and I and it defined sympathy versus empathy. I'm like, I actually have a ton of empathy. This is insane. Like, I think she was confusing sympathy with empathy. But that is such a when you're a CEO, having the empathy especially in the design build arena is so important. It, it's it's giving people space to express themselves, to be heard, and then reflecting that you've heard them and then trying to find a solution together in that kind of way. Um, David, I, I know we were only going to do a half hour. We did an hour. It, it, mm -hmm. We could probably, we could probably Joe Rogan it. We could probably do four hours, but I got to know, busy. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so man, it's so good to have you back on. I definitely, I, we should do it again one more time this year. For sure. for sure. Um, if people want to reach out to you though, and, and you know, learn more about what you guys do in, in both areas now that you're operating in, get in touch with that. How, how can they do that? Yeah, I mean, our website is www. I probably I don't have to say that anymore. I feel like I say it on every podcast. <laughs> HTTP colon slash slash. No, we are uh livecompanies.com. So that's L I V no E C O M P A N I E S dot com. Uh LinkedIn, I'm David Pollard. That's probably the easiest place to kind of find my um, happenings and things that are going on. And I try and keep people a little bit updated on what we're up to. And then, you know, our company's all over Instagram and Facebook and we like having fun showcasing the stuff we're doing and what our team's up to. Yeah. David's a rock star. Live Company, they're rock stars. Uh, I would encourage everybody listening to go follow him on LinkedIn. Keep up with him. You, you know, he does writing. He's always on podcasts. Like he's one of the guys I think to be listening to. And, and just hearing hearing about how they do it on these various platforms if, if you're thinking about taking this leap. So thanks again for, for your time today, David. We always appreciate it. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Hope to talk again soon. I'm sure yes. we will, whether in podcast or not. Actually, I need to send you an email because there's some people that um, in Boulder I got to introduce you to. You oh, yeah. Are. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks again, awesome. bud. Thanks, man. Later.